So let's move to, to technology. Um, we've got uh, a technology one-on-one. -on -one. Um, some of you may have heard Bud Watts speak last night. Bud heads the technology and software buyout business for Carlisle. He and his group have done over $4 billion or have written checks for over $4 billion of equity over the uh, more recent history. He's a graduate of the Citadel, uh, Harvard MBA. Um, he's a great friend and, um, and he, did, he and his team did the Comscope transaction which was talked about uh, last night and is a company not too far uh, away in Hickory, North Carolina. Um, he's going to be uh, talking with Fred Luddy. Fred is the founder of a company called ServiceNow. Um, he was formerly with Peregrine Systems, and Fred is, uh, by definition, a coder. He's an entrepreneur, um, and I don't think he would mind me saying this. He sort of built, built up, went down, and then has literally, from scratch, uh, along with a lot of great help, I'm sure, um, built an incredible business that is disrupting technology on a global basis. Um, the company uh, did an IPO um, and uh, in 2012 um, did $425 million of revenue last year and now currently has a market cap of almost $10 billion. I saw a couple of quotes um, that I just wanted to, to before we show a video on, on ServiceNow about Fred and I just wanted to read them to you um, about his company. The fastest growing public company taking over IT. There's a new sheriff in the IT town. Fred has said, and I'd love to hear him, his thoughts on this, recurring revenue is the eighth wonder of the world. With that, I want to introduce Bud and Fred. Well, good morning. Fred, it's my pleasure to host this uh, conversation. Before we get started, I want to fill out Fred's biography a little bit. Fred was born and raised in Indiana, and it was in Indiana that he discovered coding. He made it through his junior year of high school before he decided that coding was more fun than school. He went to work for money for a local unit of American Standard, <clears throat> and I think a fire was lit. He ultimately went back and finished high school, and then as his professional biography or his official biography says he tried to attend college, two of them in fact, but again, he found writing code much more interesting than attending school, and he actually went to work for those colleges. He ultimately left, went to the West Coast to pursue his passion of coding. Along the way, out in Silicon Valley, worked for companies like Amdahl, Bull and & Babbage, and his own enterprise software associates. He wrote code supporting mainframe, uh, excuse me, mainframe operating systems, PC, uh, video conferencing applications, and applications in both the Unix and the Linux environments. <clears throat> Immediately before starting ServiceNow, Fred was the CTO, Chief Technology Officer of a company called Peregrine Systems, which focused on IT service management, which you could tell from the video is an Im important sector from the ServiceNow perspective. He ultimately started ServiceNow in 2004, and the rest is history. We'll talk more about that in just a second. More important than all of that, though, is while he was on the West Coast, he met, fell in love with, and married his wife, Genta. They have a six-year-old son, Luke, and they make their home in San Diego, which they clearly love. So with that, Fred, we watched the video. It, it, it was a lot of stuff. It's complicated. Four minutes trying to make IT look interesting. <laughs> Tell us, uh, in your own words and in layman's terms, what it is that ServiceNow does. Well, in essence, what we try to help do is help work efficiently flow through an organization. So anytime you might request that somebody do something on your behalf or deliver something on your behalf or upgrade something in the IT or other infrastructure environments, we try to make sure that happens in the most efficient way possible, either through automation or routing the request to the right person. The company was born out of an idea that started in 1999 with uh, there was a very storied CIO of General Motors. His name is Ralph Shigenda. And he called for something called an ERP for IT. And I don't know if a lot of people in this room realize, but people like Citi and Johnson & Johnson spend multiple billions of dollars a year on IT. 
and at the end of each year, they wonder where that money went. And, um, and they wonder why they're going to need this much money next year. In fact, I had a chance to talk to Mr. Hendrick just this morning, and he said that's the same way it goes at the dealerships. You know, every year, so I don't know what these people do. So we, what we try to do is give a life cycle to IT. From the time you have an idea to the time you actually start to procure equipment and procure software to put it in place, to the time it's upgraded, to the time it's retired, keep track of all the processes that are going on to make sure it's done in the most risk averse and efficient way possible. Okay. That helped me. I hope that helped uh, everybody in the audience. Let me just give one, one more, uh, even I think, easier analogy. I started working in the office environment in 1973, and when I did, I went to copy room. There was not only the, you know, the mail slots where you picked up your inner office mail, but there were 20 or 30 or 40 forms that you would fill out to ask something to get done in purchasing or travel or take time off, those sorts of things. Our system is really not much more than an automated way of creating and routing those forms to the right people. So it's a very simple concept. It's been around for 100 plus years. But what happened in the last decade or so is that, that that structured workflow that we used to have in organizations has largely fallen into an email abyss where everything is an ad hoc request. And we're trying to pull us out of that email abyss and up into something that looks more like an Amazon.com experience where people can request information from the relevant departments without having to go find that form or, or find out who to send an email to. Great. Could I get, the, I've got one slide I'd like to put up. Could I get that up? I'm going to use some, a technical term here. Uh, this is a stock price performance chart for ServiceNow, and I'm going to say that this is one hot stock. The, uh, the stock has almost tripled in just under two years, and the market cap has more than quadrupled. And as Banks said, the market cap today is uh, between nine and $10 billion, pretty remarkable run. Uh, Fred, your business, what, what drives that stock price performance is growth, and your business has been growing at rates that you know, over the past few years have approached or exceeded 100% per year. What's driving that growth, and, and who are your competitors, and who are you taking share from? Well, there's a, a phenomenal shift in technology that's going on. People talked about the cycles of drugs and pharma. You know, IT goes through these cycles as well, where you'll settle in on the mainframe environment, and that'll last a decade, and you'll settle in on the Unix open systems environment, and that'll last a decade. Then we went through the PC era and a little bit of internet, but now everything is moving to what's being called the cloud. And the cloud's an unfortunate term because people wonder where it is. In fact, I drove by a place in San Francisco the other day and it said personal storage, and I wondered if that's where the, you know, Apple had my stuff. <laughs> but um, so the movement to the cloud, though, is something that just economically makes sense. It's all it is is a movement of everything into large data centers that are handled by companies like CoreLogic, and they do it a lot more efficiently than organizations having to have that in their own IT department. So this huge shift is happening to away from older enterprise applications into things like Workday, into Salesforce.com, and into ServiceNow. At a lower level, you see it happening in things like Google Apps and, and Amazon Web Services. So that growth trajectory is, uh, is just reflective of the adoption of cloud technologies by the large organizations that we sell to. Tell us about your, com your competition. I assume you're not, you're not fighting guys like yourself. No, uh, that's the stunning thing about people like us, Workday and Salesforce. We, in essence, our competition is, is, is procrastination and indecision. The, uh, for some reason, all the, the people that we, the entrenched vendors, the incumbents, they have 20-year-old technology, and they, they have their heads in the sand. I, used to, I, I say to our employees often that our competitors work diligently on a daily basis on our behalf. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a staggering thing that they, they just, they're in, still in a state of denial. Well, it turns out, so the competition that we have is Hewlett Packard, IBM, uh, BMC, and a little bit CA. But really the competition is, tends to be procrastination. So <clears throat> once upon a time there was a company called BMC that was, um, a public company called BMC that was for sale. 
several private equity firms looked at it. Many passed. One, one bought it. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the reasons that many private equity firms passed on it was because they were scared to death of what ServiceNow was going to do with that business. So if, because they've been losing share to you mm -hmm. uh, for quite some time, if I were on the board of BMC, what would you tell me? What would you advise me to do? Uh, I'd tell you to split it up. <laughs> yeah, there, there's some very valuable assets in there. And I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like the thesis that, that Born Partners has. There's, there's mainframe assets in there that are probably running 98% margin. Split it up. Run that company and just take the cash out of that. That cash is going to show up for the next 20 years, almost guaranteed. And then you have other uh, resources that you... There are other areas of the business that are serving a Unix marketplace, which is not necessarily growing, but it's not shrinking either. And just milk those things for cash. Similar to a, a similar strategy that CA built their business on over 20 years, which is they would buy, decimate, and then just hold the resource. Now, unfortunately, the customers generally suffer from that because you're not putting any R&D effort into it, et cetera. But, you know, it is, it, it is a great financial model. Great. All right. Um, let's uh, take us back to the very beginning. Um, you were leaving Paragon. I mean, what drove you? to start ServiceNow? Uh, <laughs> How'd you start? Well, so I, I was at Peregrine for about 13 years, and um, during that time, we had an IPO also, and the company's stock became worth a lot of money, and, and I was 40-some uh, years old, and I'm, it used to be that Function Key 5 refreshed the Yahoo stock page, and I'd watch my net worth go up when, by hitting F5, right? Well, I got up one morning and had a cup of coffee, and, and, and I hit F5, and it had gone to zero. I thought, what the hell's wrong with Yahoo? <laughs> and literally, I had a net worth of $35 million. I held on to the stock. I believed in the company. I had a net worth of $35 million. I was going to retire. I was going to be happy. And uh, then it went to zero. And uh, that was a hell of a morning. And uh, then I found out later it got worse, you know, that the company was involved in fraud. Eleven people went to prison. I got sued. I had to pay a lot of money to... Uh, defend myself in a lawsuit, but it was, it was the, the best financial thing that ever happened to me because it got me off my butt that was comfortable at Peregrine. I didn't like my job that much there, and I just decided, that's it, I'm going to start a new deal, and the time is now. Let's take advantage of it. And how, what was, uh, tell us about the original code lines written for Peregrine. How did that happen? Excuse me for service now. How did that happen? Well... <laughs> That's an interesting story, but uh, so my friend is John Morse. He's been a good buddy of mine since 1987. He, he's the M in BMC. And uh, he said, he took me on a plane flight on, on his Gulfstream, and he said in his Texas accent, he said, Luddy, what the hell are you doing back there? I said, well, I'm, I'm writing some code, John. He goes, why? I said, because if anybody ever asked me if I started this company in a garage, I'm going to say, no, I started in a Gulfstream. <laughs> Uh, so you started the company, and, and the, the company's been growing. A couple of years ago, you did something very interesting. You hired a CEO to replace yourself, and you became the chief product officer. That seems to be working out for the company. How's it been working out for you? You know, I, have the, I now thankfully have the best job on the planet that, that I could imagine. You know, I, every day I get to wake up and think about what I want to do and how I, who I want to work with and what code I need to write. But... What happened was the company did grow very quickly, and we were, um, despite of all of our efforts, we were very successful in a lot of different measures. And, um, but when we got to about 150, 200 people, I became dreadfully uncomfortable in the CEO position because I had to spend my time pretending and acting like I was a CEO, and I'm really just a programmer. So uh, Doug Leone, who was on our board, Sequoia had made an investment, said, Fred, you're going to make a decision. And you, this decision, we're going to back you either way. Do you want to be the chief product guy or do you want to be the CEO? And I said, I don't know, Doug. I'm not sure. And so he took me on a tour of Silicon Valley. He introduced me to a bunch of C, big time CEOs. And then I came back and I said, I don't have any of those skills. I don't have a desire to acquire any of those skills. I, I'm not, a, I'm not, passionate about the job. In fact, I'm dispassionate about that job. Called Doug. I said, we need to find a CEO. And um, he brought in Frank Slootman, who is 
I don't know that we could have found a better person. Uh, so he became the CEO and, uh, you know, he grew the company when he joined the company just two and a half years ago, we had 275 employees and now we have 2,200, you know, and, and so he had really has done the right thing and capital markets love him. I love him. My wife loves him. You know, my son doesn't know that he loves him, but he really loves him. <laughs> Your grandchildren don't know that they, they will <laughs> probably love him. Yes. Um, Great. You, you use a term, just stepping back a little bit, you use a term citizen developer. W what do you mean by that? Well, listen, I, I have uh, some fairly controversial views on programming. I, I, I believe that probably 90% of the people that program shouldn't and that they live to make other, try to make other people feel stupid. And I, I, did, I don't really like technology. It's not that, that's not the thing that excites me. What excites me is solving a problem. And so I believe that we should, as much as possible, eliminate, mitigate the need for programmers. And I believe that nine, you know, most people in this room can use PowerPoint, they can use Excel. When you're creating Excel, when, you're, when you create an Excel spreadsheet, you don't know it, but you're creating, in essence, a relational database. And you start doing cross-footing in there, and you're doing programming. So why should it be any more difficult to create a workflow program than it is to use an Excel spreadsheet. So when we use the term citizen developer, it's a Gartner uh, group term. What we mean is a real person, which is very different than a programmer. A real person should be able to walk up to a piece of technology and create a meaningful business application that serves their business needs. So let's say you're a small business person and you want to have, you, you just grown to 100 people and you want to have a time off request form for your employees. You should be able to draw that up on the screen and have and specify minimal workflow that happens in a couple hours. Not, not have to talk to some IT guy and wrangle for weeks just to get a simple, in essence, web page built. I just think it's ludicrous. And you see all this happening in consumer software all the time. You know that people enable storefronts and business to consumer technology through Amazon, etc. Uh, you see things like QuickBase enabling people and there. The most liberating thing you can do, one of the most joy, joyful events that happens in my life is when you put a piece of technology in front of somebody and they look at you and you said, you just made my life a little easier and I want to thank you. So my objective is to really drive down the need for programmers in general and, and, and let real people, let business people, people with a modicum of technology uh, expertise and a good deal of business sense create the applications themselves. Where are we? Are we using a baseball analogy? What inning are we in in terms of getting to a point where we can have a, where everybody can be a, a well, citizen? We're probably uh, about to start the major leagues. We are not really in an inning yet. Uh, and, and it's gone through an evolution. You know, there's all these generations of languages that have occurred in computer science over the last 60 years. And the newest levels are things like Google Docs, where people get, or people, things like Wufu, where, again, real people are creating meaningful applications, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. And these, it's going to really revolutionize the way that people look at technology. There's a quote to say that says, for technology to be successful, it needs to be indistinguishable from magic. And I think that that quote is actually a little bit off. For technology to be successful, I believe, it shouldn't be seen as technology. You know, there's phenomenal technologies like bridges and elevators, right? We don't think of those as technology. And so when technology has become something that you can naturally use, it becomes really liberating and, and, and something that you can really leverage and take advantage of. And you said that you think that the next three to five years in tech are going to be as exciting as the prior 40 put yes. together. What, yeah. Is this down that line or is this what's going to, is this what you're talking about? Well, there's, there's a, a number of major movements going on. Number one, social. So if, for those of you that have youngsters or ne nieces and nephews, they don't use email anymore. They're using social short burst communications. There's mobile, right? I'm doing everything now on my phone. I'm doing everything on my iPad. I used to lug around a laptop, but I can really take care of things. Uh, you know, people take care of stuff in the car illegally. And, but so you got social, mobile, analytics. So analytics plays into the big data play, right? We're starting to gather more and more data. The amount of data stored on this planet is nearly doubling every year. 
So that's, that's something, that it took 40 years to get to 4,000 exabytes of data. It's going to take another year to get to 8,000 exabytes of data. And 4,000 exabytes of data, I, I, I saw this on a, a TEDx video, would be books from here to Jupiter and back. You know, it's just, it's, it's staggering the amount of data that we're accumulating. And so analytics is, is, is another movement, and then cloud, right? So all of, all of these platforms are changing significantly. Five years ago, you all had a BlackBerry. Now you all have, you know, an iOS device or an Android device. That shift was, was something in five years before, those of you that were really technologically savvy, you had a Palm Pilot, right? And that's just, those markets are going away and they're giving way to all these new technologies that I think are, you know, st stunningly simple and phenomenally powerful at the same time. And a lot of money to be made with those shifts. There is a lot of money to be made. I, um, but I, I think the best people in technology, and it's myself included, I know this might be heresy in this audience, but we don't do it for money. You know, money's a, it's a great way to keep, uh, it was uh, uh, a guy said, he loves business because there's not that many rules and you keep score with money. But, you know, money's a great thing, but it's, it's not the thing. You know, what drives people like Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs isn't the money deal. It's actually ch making a ding in the universe and, and changing things for the better. Speaking of changing things for the better, uh, there are obviously tons of healthcare and pharma people in the audience today. <clears throat> I don't think it's an exaggeration to call healthcare IT a disjointed, fragmented ball of spaghetti. Have you ever uh, thought about taking that challenge on? Well, I, I've had a couple conversations with banks about that, and uh, you know, it's like so many things in my life. You think you know something until you start talking to somebody who really knows about it, and you find out you just don't know much. So I don't know that I have a, a real legitimate opinion, but I can tell you that observing what, you know, sitting in, I'm now 59, so sitting in the doctor's office more frequently, I get a chance to see Cerner, and I get a chance to see Epic, and I just think this is just agonizing. You know, I can't imagine how somebody can live in this environment. And uh, so I think there's great opportunities for the efficiency and the efficacy of, of healthcare by, by, you know, streamlining both the front end and back end processes inside the, the doctor's offices. And I, I talked to doctor friends of mine, one, one doctor, he put it quite succinctly, he said, I spend about 60% of my time with my patients and 40% of my time avoiding litigation, right? And see, so that's, that's, that's not a very good equation for healthcare. And then I've just recently been appointed to the uh, UCSD Moore's Cancer Center board and um, talking to Scott Lippman there, he's, a, he's, one of the, he's one of the better research doctors in lung cancer. And he says, what's this thing called big data? He's got, a, you know, he's got genome sequencers 40 feet away from him at the UCSD Supercomputer Center. And here's a guy that would rather squirt some stuff into a dish and see if it turns yellow under a microscope. So, but the problem is that when the doctors talk to these tech guys, the tech guys just want to talk tech. They don't want to talk problem solving. And um, you know, the, 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 that meeting of the minds, that bridge that has to be formed between the person that actually has a problem to solve and the person that knows how to build the technology is a tough bridge to build sometimes. So I think the opportunities are almost boundless. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. The government's such a huge impediment, though. The, the HIPAA thing, you know, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Lilly, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson are all customers of ours. And the amount of scrutiny we have to go through just to deploy new, new technology there is, is unfathomable. There's an endless line of people that want to audit, inspect, you know, take a look and certify. And um, there's like five, it's like, a, it's like a government works project. You have five workers and you have 500 people around, you know, making sure they're doing the right thing. So I think government is a huge impediment. I don't know how to overcome that. So you uh, said you're 59, you're approaching 60. When are you going to retire? And if you do retire, what's it going to look like? Well. My wife's lucky that <laughs> I'm not going to retire anytime soon because I'm, what did you say? I was no picnic sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't think I could retire any more than I could stop breathing. You know, that I, I wake up every morning and I, I can barely go to sleep at night thinking about things that could be and just wishing there were more hours in the day. And I, you know, I, I will stay at, at service now until I'm one of the dumber people in the room, right? Until the, we have a bunch of very bright people that are carrying this torch down the road and 
you know, in essence, they have to rip the jersey off my back to get me out of there. I, I just love what I do and hope that I get to do it for a very long time. 59 is a new 30, by the way. I, I'm with you. <laughs> well, look, Fred, uh, it, I, I will tell you personally, it's not very often that I meet, get to sit with a true visionary and pioneer of the, in the tech world, and the same goes for everybody in this room. We really appreciate your time. I think these are uh, really valuable insights, and we, we appreciate you coming. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you.